Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. Simon Phipps joins me this week. We're live at OSCON. We're going to be talking about Basho, the company that makes React. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps. Episode 346, recorded July 22nd, 2015. Basho Update. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, Libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you might not have ever heard of and want to download immediately after listening to the show. Uh, we're joined today by our, my lovely and talented co-host, Simon Phipps. Simon, welcome back to the show. Well, hello, Randall. It's a pleasure to be with you here once again at OSCON. Uh, this is becoming a, a habit now, presenting the show from the hallway uh, at the show. You didn't tell people just how exposed we are. Yeah, we're, we're here. actually right out in the middle of the hallway here, and so if you hear noise behind us or whatever, it's because there's there's real people here going to real events and stuff. Although we do have the advantage of shooting like a half hour earlier, so it is still fairly quiet here. So it's probably going to be okay. So we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, well, I, like I said, we are live from OSCON. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today, uh, someone who is also presenting at OSCON and wanted to uh, have a chat with us. It's uh, Heather McKelvey who works for the Basho co company. And uh, we had React, their main product, on about five years ago. I think it was, let me look at my notes here, on in August of 2010. And I think a lot of things have happened to React since then, and a lot of things have happened for the Basho company as well. So we're gonna bring Heather on in just a few minutes to talk about all the changes with that. Um, uh, React is a data a key value store uh, uh, for large data scales. Well, uh, at least as, as far as what I know from remembering from the show from five years ago. Uh, obviously, we'll get an update on how that's all changed in that period of time. Uh, Simon, what do you know about React? I know uh, approximately nothing. So I'm going to be uh, <laughs> looking, looking forward to finding out more about uh, the products in the company. So, I, I, reading, a li reading around the subject a little bit, it, it, I'll be very interested to find out about the community profile of the software yes. and the, uh, the business models associated with it, the degree to which there's software freedom in the projects. So I'm going to be asking questions about that, which I guess is really why you want me here. That's always why I want you here. Yes, yes, you're always really good. I'm always the geeky guy. It's fine. It's a, you've got some geekiness to you, though, so it all works out. I had some ones when I was young. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, before we bring on Heather, though, I have one very important special announcement to make. It turns out that uh, whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I personally am a DigitalOcean customer. I found out about them at scale about five months ago, and I've had my own little servlet sitting there. It came up in 55 seconds, just like they say, because DigitalOcean is built for developers. It's used by over 400,000 of them, including me. You can deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or a simple API. You get to choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and even FreeBSD, my machine's FreeBSD, because that's my favorite uh, distribution of things here. The servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. There's auto backups and snapshots that let you easily clone, deploy, and resize droplets as you grow. And you have extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on all the ways you can use your droplet. Want to deploy Docker? Set up a mail server? They've got you covered. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit digitalocean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. 
We appreciate the Solution sponsorship of Floss Weekly. So now on with the show, Heather, uh, excuse me, your name right, Heather McKelvey, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Very cool. And uh, usually at this point I say, where, where are we speaking to you from? But I know it's right <laughs> there. I can see you right over there. See, she's right over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so why don't you go ahead and give us the third, oh, I, I got to do a switch in here now. I forgot about that. <laughs> why don't you give us the 30,000 foot view of what's happened to React in the five years since and, and what are these new products you're also rolling out? Wow. Well, I've been with React about nine months, so I can tell you <laughs> some of that, but not all five years worth. Uh, we have done a great job of building a key value repository that's used by many of the Fortune 500 customers we have today and our open source community. Our open source community has picked up on it for a very scalable, highly available uh, key value store for a NoSQL database. We also support many different client accesses to it, including C, C++, Java, our utilities are built in, our core infrastructure is built in Erlang, but support for Go, Node.js, .NET are also available as well for client libraries. <laughs> the other interesting thing that we have ha found that has happened in the last few years is our open source is, uh, key value store uses infrastructure called React Core. And many of our open source customers have built their own distributed systems using React Core. Uh, so we have people using our key value repository, but we also have people who've built queuing systems on React Core, who've built actually trading systems on <laughs> React Core, much to our surprise. So uh, we've seen a lot of growth. We've seen a lot of uptake. Um, we've also seen a lot of uptake in the enterprise. And we've seen growth beyond what we originally thought would happen in scalability to getting onto petabytes of data being stored in our key value store. Uh, the company's taken a interesting growth pattern in that um, we are very close with the academics. We have done a lot of work to do research and implement a lot of what our cohorts in academia have been researching. Uh, a great example of that is our uh, CRDTs which are commutative replication data types. And when you have a NoSQL database, one of the unfortunate things that happens when you don't want to lose data is on occasion you get divergent data. Mm -hmm. You get siblings cropping up because you don't want to lose data. Uh, to resolve that, in many cases, we have in the past and our competitors in the past have I'll ask the client to determine how to resolve the divergent data. With CRDTs, you can see the data types resolving that divergent data themselves with the within the infrastructure. We released that over a year and a half ago and have seen great uptake in it. Um, the CRDTs have been very, very good evolution for the NoSQL database and for our customers to be able to resolve the divergent data. Uh, and that's what you're going to see a lot more of coming soon. Customers are less interested in understanding what data to keep and what data to throw away. Uh, they want the system to do it for them, and we're getting much smarter about that going forward. Awesome. That was a nice long answer. I like nice long answers, so that's great. So let's, let's, let's take it back a couple steps. Um, so React is a NoSQL key value store, data mm -hmm. store. But what was that piece you are talking about, about CRDTs? How does that... Does that make that more reliable, or what does it, it do? It, so, when you deal with a no, when, when you deal with a NoSQL database, you're choosing the NoSQL database for the scalability, the reliability, and the fact that it's not going to lose data. Mm -hmm. So, NoSQL databases replicate data, and it's up to you how many copies you want to keep. Yeah. This is very convenient in the fact that one, if you've got three copies and they're stored on different nodes, a node goes down, you still have two copies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when a node does go down, uh, our database actually moves data to ensure it still has three copies no matter what. Mm -hmm. When a node comes back up, it moves the data back to where it needs to be. Unfortunately, you're taking writes at the same time, and we happen to be a masterless solution. Right. And that means any node can take a write. And while a replication is being made, it is very common for another right to come in to that same piece of data and update. And that can actually create a divergence of data between the three copies. Oh, oh I get it, okay. Okay. 
Now, in the past, and this is true for every NoSQL database, in the past, all of us who provide NoSQL databases said, client, you figure out what's the right piece of data. Um, which, you know, could, rightly so, they've said, I don't want to have to figure it out. Yes. Um, you, you're the infrastructure, you figure it out. So many of us used either vector clocks, and in our case, we use dotted version vectors to put a timestamp on that to try and resolve it. Mm -hmm. But on occasion, you can, with the amount of data coming into these databases, you can have the same timestamp, mm -hmm. even down to the microseconds, and the data can diverge. So CRDTs allow the system itself to resolve what should be the correct data if you have the same timestamp, but the data itself and the object is different. Okay, uh, so let's talk also about uh, this React is open source or you wouldn't be here. There's probably that's some right. version of React though that's open source. Is there like a premium edition and, and, a, and an enterprise edition or something? Can you describe the differences there? Yes, the difference uh, between our open source solution is uh, really additional functionality. So everything that's in the key value store in open source is in the key value store in the enterprise edition. The enterprise edition includes additional functionality for cross data center mm -hmm. replication and cross data center management. And so if you're if you're using this the utility in one data center, it behooves you to start with the open source version. It has all the functionality. Um, it's only when you move to cross data center that it behooves you to take advantage of the enterprise version. So uh, I've just been looking at your GitHub repository on here, and I can't find the open source license. So tell me what open source license this code is licensed under. React? Yes. It should be Basho. Uh, I'm looking at... I'm look, I'm, Git Basho? I'm looking at Git Basho, I'm looking at React KV, mm -hmm. and there's no license file in your GitHub repository, so it's not under an open source license. It actually is. We're cleaning that up. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so which open source license should I have found in the Git repository? I believe it's the MIT. MIT license? Yes. Okay. And um, I, I, I noticed also looking at the Basho website that um, there's no encouragement to go uh, engage on GitHub. I had to dig, dig around quite a lot to find your, uh, your GitHub link. Um, do you actually want people to collaborate over the React source code? We actually do. We right. want, uh, and, and in fact, all of engineering customer services pays close attention to the IRC channel. Mm -hmm. um, we're the ones who answer it. So yes, we do. And that's something we should clean up and promote more on the, on the so site. Do you accept pull requests? Oh, yes. Well, everyone accepts pull requests. Do you pay any attention to pull requests? <laughs> we, pay we pay very close attention to the pull requests. Um, where, where we, like any other vendor, sometimes come into competition or conflict is if we're currently working something that the pull request came in on. What we also do within our core infrastructure is there's things like the web machine. Um, we're not necessarily the manager of that. So uh, in the case of the web machine, um, the manager of that is actually somebody from Comcast. So uh, we're looking at moving Logger out into a different owner of Logger as well, which is the logging facility. Um, so we probably should be better at promoting it our, on our site, but uh, we are very active on the pull requests and we encourage them immensely. So I, again, I'm looking at the stats. Mm -hmm. um, to what degree would you say you have a collaborative community around React? And to what degree would you say you are actually a, 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 a corporate-led software project that has a few external um, contributors? We've been open source for six years now. So we've been, we've been very closely working with the open source community. Um, we try and encourage it more. Um, we have uh, been sending our engineers to encourage it to many different shows. We just did Lambda Jam. Uh, we do a number of things with Sync Free in the EU. We encourage them to contribute it as well. So we, we work very hard to encourage it. Uh, and then, then um, as you were talking with Randall, you were saying about how you have a, uh, a freemium model. Uh, mm -hmm. So now how, how does that work? Because generally I'm very skeptical of freemium models because I believe that giving your customers software freedom is the key value of open source. Mm -hmm. And so if the, if the open source value stops with the supplier, the, what's delivered to the customer isn't actually open source. 
Um, how do you feel about that? Do you actually want your customers to have software freedom? Yes, we do. You do? Yes, we do. We think there's great value. There are certain times when we think that there is value in IP. And the IP that's in the EE, the only difference between that is what does the replication across data centers. Right. Enter data center, you have the exact, you can scale it as far as you like. It is the exact same code that you get in the enterprise model. So the, 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 the critical test for um, uh, a, a, a freemium model is whether your freemium customers are able to uh, stop using you as a supplier. Well, uh, and so the, the, yeah. the real question is, if, you, if I'm using your enterprise version, to what degree am I actually free to, to stop trading with you and carry on using the software? How much would I lose if I did that? You would have to implement replication across data centers if you had were across data centers. Many of our customers actually start with the freemium model. Mm -hmm. um, and because all of the functionality that's in, in one data center is in the open source, it's easy for them to start with that. And they can have multiple clusters within one data center and do the replication within one data center. It's only when they want to go cross data center that they either need to implement that replication across the data centers or they need to uh, they need to sign up for the enterprise. So for many of our customers, it's a natural transition to start with the open source, which is actually what we do. The sales model is one called land and expand. Mm -hmm. The land is open source. Mm -hmm. That's what they start with. And because it is all the same functionality in the key value store that's in the enterprise product, it's very easy for them to start with that. Right. So looking at your extended community, how many people would you say are committing code to React who don't work for you? That's a good question. I don't have that number. Um, I think we probably get about 20, 30 pull requests a week. Mm -hmm. And are those, what's, what are those from? Are those from customers or are those from people who are not customers who are using the code elsewhere? Uh, a lot more so not customers mm -hmm. who are using the code elsewhere right. than, than customers. Right. Yeah. And do you have any, any um, uh, use of the code that is unrelated to your business? So, so do you have anybody who's picked the code up and is using it in their business somewhere else? Yeah. So, so as a peer contributor? It, as a peer contributor, absolutely. So um, as I said before, React KV, the repository itself, is built upon some infrastructure called React Core. And the React core is the infrastructure that does the core infrastructure for distributing systems. We have numerous uh, non-customers and customers who actually have built other applications that are not key value stores on top of React core. Uh, and m some of them have actually open sourced their applications. Right. Uh, and so we support them through that. Uh, we've actually had a couple of uh, Fortune 500s come to us and say, we would like to open source this application we built on React Core. Uh, can you help us with that? And we've assisted them with that as well. Can you uh, tell me some of the typical applications for React? I think you mentioned a few of them at the top of the show, but uh, uh, what kind of people, what, when, what problem would you be solving when you reach for React? Highly scalable, highly available, uh, base, JS, usually JSON is the type of data that's stored. Um, many of our, from, the, from what we understand, <laughs> from what we can divine from the open source community, but also more so what we know from our enterprise community, we're very popular with um, national healthcare outside the United States, where mm. they have national healthcare. Um, uh, that's everywhere. <laughs> Apart from the United States. Just, sorry. The, yeah. We're very popular there because we don't lose data. Uh, we're very popular in the gaming industry, and when I talk about the gaming industry, I mean not just playing games online like Riot Games, mm -hmm. but also the gambling industry, which is also outside the United States everywhere. Yes, and it's a big technology <laughs> sector as well. It is a big technology sector. Uh, and then uh, we uh, are very popular with technology in general, so people who are gathering large amounts of data that are going to have to run uh, analytics against it to understand what their business problems. So the general technology sector. So are we talking petabytes of data in some of these stores or? We are talking petabytes of data in some of these stores. Yes, it's the scalability is, um, when React started six years ago and over time, we've never been able to acquire that many machines or even pay that big of an AWS bill <laughs> to figure out how far it can go. But uh, we have customers who have, well into the many hundreds of nodes. 
Are most of these probably on something like AWS then, or, or what are the deployment locations? It's, it's I think, about 50-50 between um, cloud, which is very commonly AWS, yes. and uh, and their own data centers. Okay, yeah. and, and uh, uh, I was looking through your literature that you sent me, uh, or somebody sent me earlier. It looks like you're also looking at providing a platform yourself that would be kind of a hosting for React? Yeah, well, over the years, I mean, NoSQL's been around for quite a few years now, and we've all grown, we've all learned. And a lot of what we've learned are about workloads. What are common workload patterns? And how is the data actually finally being used to answer business issues, mm -hmm. right? And so common workload patterns have evolved. You'll see common workload patterns specific to high rights mm -hmm. because you cannot lose the data. You'll see a common workload pattern specific to analytics and BI where you've got range scans of reads. You've got to do massive amount of reads. We found uh, between ourselves and our customers and many of the open source community that these patterns then end up defining how you're going to architect your data platform. So if you've got high rights and high reads for every NoSQL database vendor, they tend to compete with each other. <laughs> so you want to architect things appropriately. So there is a cliff point at which you want to separate those two workloads. And that cliff point has to do when they start competing with each other for the resources on the, on the machines, whether they're virtual machines or, or dedicated, hard metal. And so what we found is that those workloads define the architecture customers need to build, and our customers are tending to build the same platforms. They're building data platforms. Many of them are building data services available to subsequent applications or utilities on those data platforms. And so we have decided if they're going to build them, and we've got hundreds building them, maybe we should be building some portion of that so they can leverage it. And so we're, uh, we're releasing our data platform utilities. Uh, we're in beta with them now. We're starting with Redis support. Many of uh, our open source community and our customers have said, I use Redis, it's great, but it's got this out of memory issue. I need a quick way to make sure it's refreshed. I'd like to use it as a cache. And so support for Redis and in immediate support for Redis from React as its persistent store is one of the utilities that we're introducing. And then Spark. Um, we, like many others, introduced MapReduce. MapReduce is a great batch utility. Spark is uh, seeming to meet many of the customer's needs for better real-time analytics. And so support, support for Spark Connector uh, is, has been released into beta as well. I'm uh, not actually familiar with Spark. You want to explain that for our audience? It's, it's a patchy foundation uh, utility. It's very commonly used for analytics. Um, it is uh, getting a lot of adoption. Oh, sorry. It's getting a lot of adoption. Um, it, unlike uh, MapReduce, it seems to have better ease of uh, analytics use and operations. Uh, it supports streaming, and the streaming means it gets uh, analytics closer to real time. Okay, thank you for explaining that, yes. Sure. Um, actually, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, so how, how, how oh, I should put myself on the screen again. I, I'll make mistakes, watch it, okay. <laughs> um, I apparently let anybody do this show, so there we go. Um, I'm thinking in terms of, what kind of a workload is this on the, the operations team as opposed to the, say, the people who are building the, the code? Is there, is there a lot of, is it really simple to just drop in and make it work or do you have to do a lot of, uh, uh, of, of um, thinking and planning like you were talking about earlier? Yeah, well, when we originally built React KV, one of the goals we had, and it still is one of our common goals, which is ease of operations, ease of use. Even ease of installation, get it up and running. Mm -hmm. And so it's natural for us to extend that requirement and that goal to the data platform solutions so that people can easily install Spark, have it run with uh, React, have it run with their existing data. Uh, Spark as it stands today is reliant on a utility called Z Zookeeper. And the reason for that is Spark is a master and worker uh, cluster, mm -hmm. and Zookeeper does something called the leader latch election service for it. it. It tells Spark, here's your leader, and when a leader fails, it tells it, here's your new leader. Um, we 
felt that Zookeeper, while it's useful, was just one more component. So we built our own leader latch election service built on top of React. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and so it removed one more component for the ease of installation and getting the solution up and running more quickly. Okay, very cool. And uh, are there... Are there like Docker containers and stuff set up with this already so I can drop it into an existing solution? We have, uh, we, we actually um, are going to be uh, releasing some Vagrant containers. Docker will come after that. Okay. Uh, but that we do support use of Docker, Vagrant, um, Ansible for orchestration. Uh, and so, and a lot of that is actually originally contributed by the community. They continue to contribute to it. Uh, and and some of this, and it will be open source. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I, I'm going to follow up on the open source a, a, a little bit further. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in your choice of the MIT license for React because my experience is that companies that are going to use a freemium model typically use the GPL because uh, the, the, the freemium model is often associated with a tactic that I call scareware where you, uh, the customer, once they've started using the software, doesn't want to be subject to the terms of the GPL and so therefore buys the enterprise version. Mm -hmm. Now, you picked the MIT license. Why did you pick the MIT license? You're beyond my history now. Right. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm actually not sure. I don't know why it was picked, to be honest yeah. with you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so supplemental. Um, uh, tell me about your, con your contributor process. Do you uh, get contributor agreements from your contributors when you accept pull requests? In other words, do you take, do you ask for ownership of the copyright when people make contributions and so accumulate it in Basho? Or are you having, developing a community shared copyright model? It's a community shared copyright yeah. model. Yeah. So, so how does that affect your ability to offer your premium version? Oh, again, the open source, okay. For each component that's in open source, mm -hmm. uh, such as React KV, that is exactly what is in the enterprise version. There is no difference. Once, uh, what is in the component that's called logger or the component that's called uh, clique, which is our CLI command interface, um, all those components, our handoff component, uh, that is all exactly the same code that sits in our enterprise version. It's only additional packages that are in our enterprise version. I, I suppose by using the MIT license, an MIT license is as good as a copyright grant anyway, uh, because that's basically all that it, all it says is you can use my stuff mm -hmm. uh, in the license. So so you, so you're, you, that must mean your contributing process is quite simple. You can just accept pull requests. As long as the pull request states that it's under the license of the project, you're, you're, you're golden with that. Yeah. Um, I didn't see whether there was any of that uh, in the in the project, it looked to me like there wasn't very much of, the, of a contribution instruction in there. Yeah, we, um, Basho uh, is, shall we say, we lapsed a little bit in our support of, of the, the resourcing for building the community, not in support of the engineering portion of the community, but more of the uh, marketing and, and outreach to the community. We, we did lapse for a little bit. And we've now rebuilt that, and so we have, have a, a really great leader for it, Matthew Brender. Right, so you have a community, a community leader. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, to what to what degree is that making a difference to you as a company, having that open source community? Because the, the again, I've worked with a number of startup companies, and they're very skeptical about the value of an open source community contributing to their core code. They tend to see that as interference rather than assistance. Uh, how do you feel about it? Um, you cannot get as much done with your own engineering team as you can get with the community, flat out. You also can't get as many great ideas. Um, we all know when you bring 10 engineers together, you get some really great stuff. But uh, when you bring hundreds of engineers together and they're all passionate, you get a lot more. Do you get a lot more conflict? Absolutely. Is it good energetic conflict? Absolutely. And so we actually get, a, we end up having a much better, much richer, and quite fr frankly, a, a more stable solution. Right. Especially when they follow the code of conduct, they do their unit tests, they've, they have invested in what they are contributing into the source. Right, so you do, so there's a, there's a, there's a there's some governance for your community as well. You're not just using, what, uh, there's something that I call Git governance, which is where we do our own thing and you make pull requests and we might accept them. That's, that's that's what I call Git governance. Yeah. So you're doing more than Git governance. You have you have a code of conduct. You you have some published unit tests. You have a workflow. You have a, a build farm, perhaps. 
We uh, do have a bill form. It's called Giddy Up. Right. Uh, you can go to it and see exactly how poorly or well we're doing passing our tests. Uh, it is it is out there, open to the public. Uh, we are uh, like every community, uh, whether uh, whether you're uh, moving fast uh, or moving faster. Keeping up with the test is always secondary to uh, keeping up with the um, keeping up with the the submissions, and so. Uh, we, we do encourage folks to uh, bring in as many unit and preferably integration tests as possible. We add that back into something called React Test. Right. We also have Basho Bench, which is open source, uh, which is the benchmarking utility. We encourage people to contribute to Basho Bench. Uh, and so it's very easy for people to see how things are performing. So another uh, direction that I was going to ask about was about how you make decisions and about the code direction with your community. Uh, are you setting the roadmap for the direction the code takes, or is it being driven by contributions that are coming in from your community, or is it a mix of the two things? It's a mix of the two things. Um, we have our own roadmap that where we are getting direct feedback from the community and our customers. Um, in some cases, not all components uh, are managed by us. Right. And so that manager is responsible for contributing and helping to set the roadmap as well. And so we ask for their feedback as well. Um, we don't, uh, the manager really has the last say over where that component's going. Okay. okay. So now I have one more line of inquiry to have with you. I, I, um, it, no, no sequel is a very busy market. Uh, it is. It has, and it has a, it has a, a, a sizable monkey in the market that you might even call a gorilla in the shape of Mongo. Uh, how do you feel you're doing in, in that marketplace in comparison to the many, many other NoSQL databases? So, as an aside, I've always been fascinated by the idea of NoSQL databases because we've had key value stores behind uh, relational databases ever since they were invented. So, the sudden desire to use the relational st the, the store without the, the relational engine is always fascinates me. But of course, there's loads of them out there because um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those enjoyable software, uh, uh, software study problems to design a key value store. Mm -hmm. So how are you doing? I mean, how, how are you facing up to this um, massive competition from all those other key value stores and all those other large data array systems that are out there? Uh, so you bring up a great one, Mongo. Um, Mongo is a very valuable uh, relation, uh, NoSQL store. It is easy for people to use because it is uh, has a lot of the same concepts that a relational database has. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for them to latch onto. Uh, and I think they did a great job building it. What has what they what they find on occasion uh, is that if people do not thoroughly think through how they're going to do the key construct in Mongo. They end up loading a lot of data into the database and then having to reshard. And sometimes that resharding forces people to bring the database down. Right. Okay? I think that's one of the challenges Mongo has run into. I think they're very popular. We're finding numerous people who have been using Mongo for six to, uh, four to six months looking around again. Um, it is a great way to start. It's a very valuable database. They've done some great work recently on their performance and their scalability. But uh, many people, when they start out with a NoSQL database, whether it's Mongo or, or us or anything else, forget that it's not the case that you don't need to understand the NoSQL database, right? You've got a difference in this adoption scenario. In a, re a relational database, you've got somebody who's hired a bunch of DBMS people, they have a lot of knowledge, they have a lot of investment, and so they want to consolidate to one. In the ca case of a NoSQL database, it's usually a software engineer who's being asked to go do the proof of concepts with some set of requirements. And that software engineer is going to choose a solution that meets the requirements they're looking at. Uh, what we find very often, and uh, before joining Basho, I was CTO for a cloud company in San Francisco. And one of the things we saw was uh, of our 70 
the 70% of the largest customers, two thirds were running three NoSQL databases on our cloud. And they were all three different NoSQL databases, which got me curious. I was like, why? Why is there this, you know, well, we'll choose three different solutions. And, what, and it came down to the fact that it was a software engineer making a decision based on a requirement that they understood for a specific workload. So very often they might choose MongoDB, then they might choose Cassandra, then they might choose React, and it was differing requirements that made them choose. With NoSQL databases also, it's quite frankly much easier to move the data. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's much easier to move to a different solution when you find out the, re the original requirements you started with when you reach scale are no longer the same requirements. And so that is not unusual to have happen as well. We actually have a question from the chat room. We have a chat room that's going on live during the show, and it's, uh, who ate my tuna? Beautiful handle, I'll tell you, that's great. Now, what are they doing differently to lower the barrier to entry to using their platform over something like MongoDB? Or did you just answer that? I don't, it's, part of that answer is probably there, but if there's anything else you want to say about that. Part of that answer is probably there. Um, Oh, uh, we are uh, we are in the process of working on new, shall we say, opinionated versions of React KV. And um, one of the things we're investigating is possibly a SQL-like uh, language, which makes it very easier for people to move from a relational database mm -hmm. to a NoSQL database. I would say one of the biggest challenges uh, for many NoSQL users for the first time is there is no query language, or the query language is not as rich as you have in a relational database. And what we're finding in the evolution of NoSQL databases is different types of new query languages cropping up. Clearly something very akin to a SQL query language is very useful. Um, we're also looking at new types of query languages based on materialized views. Mm and possibly even pre-materialized views. Uh, so I think part of the evolution we'll see over the next year or so is new and much more useful query languages for the relational, for the NoSQL databases. So will the, uh, will the query language be a lot like what Hadoop does then, to kind of do the MapReduce stuff, or is it going to be something entirely different? I view the MapReduce and the um, Spark as more of an analytic solution. I think the query languages will be based uh, on uh, 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 on just trying to get to the data you're at, whereas analytics is a different type of solution of trying to get massive amounts of data and get information out of that massive amount of data, which is what you're going to use MapReduce for or Spark. Okay, okay, that clears it up. And in fact, that leads right to my next question, which is, is there anything else on the roadmap, either short-term or long-term, that we haven't talked about yet that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Um, so one of the interesting things that is, uh, that is bubbling up as, as one of the common, more solidified work patterns is time series-based solutions. And time series-based solutions are very, very useful for many people. Many people out there don't even know they're building time series-based solutions on their NoSQL databases. <laughs> uh, and so what you'll see is a lot better uh, solutions for large amounts of read scans, uh, quantas, being able to read a quanta of data uh, will be very important. And this is this can be a challenge in a NoSQL database because you've replicated this data all around a very large cluster. Uh, and making sure that you're getting back what you need to get back. Uh, something else that we're seeing a lot of use of in uh, the 2.0 release a year and a half ago, we introduced strong consistency. And strong consistency takes it back to uh, Yes, we will guarantee you this is the correct data situation, where as opposed to eventually consistent, which is, yeah, you know, it may not be the absolute latest, but eventually it will be consistent around the node. And so strong consistency, we're seeing a strong demand for. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no pun intended. <laughs> Sorry. That's good. Um, That's good. And so uh, strong consistency is also influencing a different type of work pattern as well. And. Uh but it sounds like at some point to get strong consistency, you have to violate the CAP theorem, or is you just saying that you're emphasizing the C over the AP? You're emphasizing the C over the AP. You're never, if you started out as eventually consistent, you're, you're never going to get rid of that. Um, the uh, unfortunate secret, and this is true of relational databases as well, is with strong consistency, your performance is going to degrade somewhat, because now you're saying, I have a quorum, and that quorum must say, 
yes, this is the correct data. Awesome. Well, we've asked a lot of questions. You've answered a lot of questions. Is there anything we didn't ask that you wanted to make sure our audience is aware of before we let you go? Uh, so this is, this is an exciting time. Uh, we're with all of the workload patterns emerging, not just from people's usage, but from uh, some very interesting research that's being done. I think eventually in the next couple of years, we're going to see a consolidation in this industry. Um, but we're also going to see much more useful Oper uh, utilities out of box so that as people build their data platforms they can easily have them up and running in very little time just as they do now with a NoSQL database and, th and that's going to be a nice evolution of the, uh, of the utilities. The other thing that's interesting is we see customers building new types of data systems, uh, excuse me, data services. Data services you never thought would be there 10 years ago. Um, things that allow you to market given what the weather is in a specific location. Uh, so new types of data services will be very interesting as we move forward. And, and many of the leaders in this are realizing that they're not about getting to the business solution, the business answers they need, but they're actually evolving their company into being a data services company. That's a really awesome answer. Thank you for all, for all that. And thank you for the interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. All right. That, that was Heather McKelvey, who is uh, representing uh, Basho. Um, so what do you think, Simon? Well, it's all uh, quite interesting. I've, uh, when I was at uh, MariaDB, I took a good look at, uh, at the NoSQL market. And uh, it's, it is indeed a, a rich, vibrant, and uh, lively place. And um, uh, looking at this project, uh, you know, I, I hope that they're going to focus some more on their community engagement. Because I think that could be what they need to do to differentiate in the, what Heather uh, mentioned when she was speaking, there's going to be a consolidating market soon. I think that's going to be important to them. And uh, I, my sense was that that community engagement was uh, needed a, a, some fresh fuel. Um, so uh, the, the technology itself looks uh, perfectly serviceable, as they say. Uh, you know, it, look, it looks like it's probably good stuff. Okay, very good, very good. Well, let's talk about some upcoming guests. We're just wrapping up the show here. We, uh, next week we have Talkie. That's a video chat and screen sharing application. Uh, just added to the list uh, because we were talking to them and wanted to talk to them here at OSCON, but uh, we can't fit four different guests into the same <laughs> the same half hour slot. So uh, we're going to be having an update on OpenStack. It's been five years since OpenStack was announced. In fact, announced on this very show five years ago. Very, very awesome. But they're going to come back and tell us what has happened in those five years. Uh, immediately following that, also added the schedule just now uh, is a CoreOS update. CoreOS, so we talked to them only about a year ago, but it's been a lot of stuff that's been happening. They've just announced recently, or in the last uh, couple of days, uh, a new project called Tectonic, which is a mix of Kubernetes, which we're also going to be talking to in a couple of weeks, uh, plus CoreOS, plus Docker. Uh, we've got uh, Harlan Sten, a network time protocol. We, uh, we've got uh, Kubernetes, like I said, Google's cluster management. Uh, we've got uh, FWK NOP, which I don't know how to pronounce without it being bad. So uh, I think I'm just reading the letters from now on. Uh, it's a port knocking next generation stuff, single packet authorization, all that sort of stuff. We have uh, Gambus, which is a uh, free object oriented basic inspired by Visual Basic. Ichinga, which is a fork of Nagios. We can talk about how forks are sometimes hostile, like right then. Uh, scalable and extensible monitoring system, that is. And we're bringing back Casp, well, no, not bringing back, we're bringing back Dart, because there's been a whole lot of stuff that's happened with Dart community in the last couple of years since we had Seth Ladd on. We're actually going to have Casper Lund who's one of the key developers, and Andrew Sanholm was one of the community coordinators. That's ought to be really fun. So those are all found, of course, on the uh, TV slash Floss homepage, um, uh, the homepage for the show. There's a link there to the big spreadsheet that has all the information on it, including all the guests that we're already in the middle of talking to. If there's a project you want on this show that is not on that list, please have the project leader or the community coordinator email me, Merlin at StoneEngine.com. That email address is on the homepage, twitch.tv slash floss. We do have a live stream while we're taping. It, uh, we usually tape at 8 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. Uh, and you can go to live.twit.tv. You can actually make your own comments. We took a couple questions from the uh, chat room there. You can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. You can follow, uh, that also mirrors over to Twitter, Floss Weekly. Uh, you can follow me at uh, Merlin, M-E-R-O-Y-N. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I'm also Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Uh, I was a guest on Decentralized, which is a podcast about Bitcoin and decentralized uh, decision-making, things like that. If you go to decentralized.fm, you'll find the show. I think it's last week's show. I was also a guest on the ClueCon podcast, which is about the voice over IP conference, free switch and all that. 
Uh, I, I think, how do I, I don't know how, I, just find it. Just Google Klukon Randall Schwartz, you'll probably find that particular interview. Uh, I did a brief introduction to DART. Uh, that's on my slide share. Uh, that, uh, this is a talk I gave down in Fizzley last week or two weeks ago. Uh, just a little forward announcement. I will be at the Heathrow Sofitel uh, the evening of July 31st in preparation for a 14-day cruise coming out of there. So uh, I'll be tied up between 6 and 7, but if there's anybody that's anywhere near that area and wants to uh, hook up with me, watch my Google Plus announcement or uh, my Twitter announcements, and we'll find a way to get together. Uh, and then it'll be gone for two weeks. The show will be in good hands, though. We'll still have shows going on. In fact, it's the two shows that we just scheduled, OpenStack and CoreOS. Uh, uh, good friend Aaron Newcomb is going to be managing that for this. Uh, and I think that's all I want to plug right now. Simon, do you think you want to plug? Uh, so in addition to those things, if you're at OSCON at the moment, um, I'm going to be wandering around the show with my trusty 4K TV camera. Uh, constructing a clip show for the inevitable period somewhere over the two months where we drop the ball and there actually isn't a Floss Weekly. So if you'd like to record a five to ten minute uh, discussion about your open source project, catch me in the halls at OSCON and we can do it there and then with my, uh, my, my magic Steadicam. Uh, I'm going to be attending uh, FrostCon, the German open source conference, which is held in uh, St. Christoph near Bonn. That's going to be in uh, uh, the weekend of the 22nd of August, and I'd love to see you there. Uh, I'll also be attending the LibreOffice conference, which is being held uh, in Scandinavia, uh, the 23rd, 24th, and 25th of September. And uh, there is a fighting chance that I may find myself at OSCON Europe on the 26th to the 30th of October. If you're going to be attending any of those, I would be delighted to see you. Um, I'm still writing for uh, InfoWorld occasionally when I can persuade Eric to buy my stories. I'm writing a, uh, a column every month in Linux Voice magazine, which you should be subscribing to because it is a, a great grassroots Linux how-to magazine. Uh, apart from those things, that's all I have to put at the moment. Very good, and thank you, Simon, for stopping by and helping me do the interview, and uh, we'll see you again next time on Floss Weekly.